second. Yeah, and set the context for today's discussion. So we all know that the pace of growth that Delhi's metropolitan region has seen has had a definite impact on population density, the built up area and change in land use share, which has also had a dramatic impact on urban villages themselves. I'm just gonna... So um, what this means is a significant shift in their density and demographic composition from being about 20 villages in 1961. In 2011, we had 135 urban villages, which were inhabited by 6.4% of Delhi's population, according to the 2000 population estimates. While urban villages are often used as a planning category, they themselves are very heterogeneous and they exist across a, diff a huge spectrum of urban transition. Many of them suffer from poor physical and social infrastructure, have seen transformations in their livelihood patterns. Some of them also exist in very close proximity to the ecologically sensitive or archeologically significant structures. So urban villages therefore require context specific development plan. Uh, what WRI study actually did over the past years was to sort of understand the kind of challenges that these villages face and how can they be provisioned for and planned for better. So what started as a part of this study was to understand the situation in these villages and have an existing situation analysis, identification of key issues, which led to documenting what kind of best practices we have, what are the sort of good examples available through national and international case studies. Uh, which sort of shaped up how we engaged with communities uh, on ground. So as Madhav mentioned before, we partnered with uh, the government to actually do community engagements in two specific urban villages in NCT, which is Rajokri and Goga, where we were involved with the community in identifying and prioritizing their needs and also uh, having community workshops through design charrettes. Uh, where we could engage with the community and understand what kind of issues and aspirations they bring to development planning. This research study and on-ground learnings were actually used to sort of develop a broad urban village development plan framework uh, that we'd actually sent along with the concept note. I'll just briefly go over uh, some of the constituent elements and principles. So what, it, what this framework does is to sort of work as a guidance framework uh, and sort of structure local planning processes for urban villages. One thing is to sort of incorporate principle, good governance principles of being participatory, being accountable, retain essence of place and maintain a certain sort of iterative process to planning. Uh, again, it should be able to be customizable to different kinds of urban villages and sort of respond to where they are located on the spectrum. Um, apart from that, what is important in building a representative and diverse sort of participatory planning process is to sort of, uh, have a broad range of stakeholders. So the key stakeholders that could be a part of such a UVDP would be municipal officers, you know, Delhi Village Development Board members, members from its local arm, which are the village development committees or the local coordination committees, your ward cooperators or MLAs, development authority representatives, such as members from the DDA. Then you can have uh, community organizations, social workers or Anganwadi workers who are very, very active in some of the villages that even we went to, uh, village panchayat members and key informants or gatekeepers and field experts. So how do these stages sort of align to what kind of objectives UVDP or any kind of a local development plan uh, that can be envisioned for urban villages? So the first few stages is to sort of assess the current situation, which is where we place the preliminary urban village appraisal and which gives us the first connect to the field to understand it through your, uh, you know, to understand the current situation and then deepen that engagement through a detailed existing situation appraisal that builds into collation of findings, synthesis and analysis of what is required, what are the 
locating the key domains of action that can sort of streamline uh, our issues and our aspirations towards early stages of drafting the UVDP through asking the questions of what is the kind of future that we envision apart from the challenges that we wish to overcome. This would sort of set the ball rolling in terms of thinking about questions of how do we aim to achieve this, which is where you know the downstream or advanced stages of uh, UVDP uh, could sort of come in to think of how do we implement such a plan on ground, uh, laying out financial outlays, timelines, phasings, uh, and getting the process towards you know, progress and review and revision, and thus keeping the circle moving towards enabling an iterative sort of process where you mandate reviews and revisions and course corrections uh, while being you know, time bound in a sense. Uh, the next few slides break down each of these specific framework stages further and look at what kind of, uh, here they briefly outline what kind of methods can be used uh, to facilitate such processes and how they flow into the next stage. So from the PUVA where you have the first sort of recce surveys and establish your stakeholder sort of uh, relationships and understand feelers from the ground that builds into having a more detailed engagement where you do your, you know, your uh, topographic surveys, you map the settlements, you actually understand the dynamics, not only in a, of the physical settlement, but also at the community level build in your partnerships with stakeholders and take in their feedback on the kind of findings that you sort of gather through workshops. Uh, this leads us to the bulk of the matter, which is where we start preparing a development plan, uh, having our assessments in place, collating them, analyzing and identifying which, uh, which domains need action and what kind of actions they need. Um, Co-creating a larger vision with the uh, urban village settlements and commun the community within these settlements and stakeholders, as we had mentioned before, uh, to talk about what kind of strategies can work for such settlements, uh, how to sort of look at the financial outlays uh, and how to assign responsibility. And also working with the DCRs, which the development control regulations, which may sit between a larger permissible sort of limit that a macro planning instrument gives, but is not site specific. Uh, this can sort of feed into finalizing the plan and also getting your permissions and sanctions, preparing an outreach program to sort of work with the community and make them, uh, you know, partner even in understanding how this will all work out. Uh, again, also taking in disputes and disagreements that may occur and try to think of what can be ways of course corrections or minimizing grievances, which can finally lead into the advanced stages of implementing the plan, uh, determining your processes for tendering and contracting, for budgeting and fund dispersal, as well as building a robust m &E such that you, know, you can have uh, accountability in terms of taking in your short-term uh, outcomes as well as long-term impacts. And here mandating reviews once in five years and revisions once in 10 years can always help in having sort of a plan that is sensitive to the changing environment within these settlements itself. So broadly, while urban villages have very specific forms and dynamics based on their locations, there are certain existing challenges which often many of them suffer from, especially in terms of integrated planning. And we sort of made some buckets here just to sort of uh, take the discussion forward and look at some of the key areas which remain big links or challenges for urban villages. So densification and unregulated growth triggered by urbanization. You have subsequently change in your livelihoods patterns, your social composition, you have local power dynamics and larger markets, market forces that sort of structure how communities sort of interact on ground. And then you have stats, uh, you know, your stasis in your policy and plan, uh, planning, uh, policy and planning domains, which are not able to address the kind of challenges that they face. 
So what we've uh, seen even both through our secondary review and uh, our primary sort of work was that urban villages and communities remained on the margins. So while the UVDP provides an outline for local planning, uh, we also need certain approaches that can make so, such planning frameworks actually relevant and effective in moving forward. And out of a range of these approaches, we've decided to sort of go float three key uh, factors that we can open up this discussion with. The first one is building participatory processes in development planning. The second, ensuring livable densification and repurposing. And the third being, seeking convergence in existing challenges, in existing schemes and provisions, and streamlining implementation and monitoring mechanisms. I'll briefly, I'll try to quickly run through each of these approaches and also present a few examples that might help us uh, in thinking of best practices or you know, innovative ideas used in certain you know, contexts uh, in both national and international sites. So about building participatory processes for development planning. While these communities have remain, remained on the margins, one needs to sort of think of how can then public participation be ensured? What can be an active sort of public involvement, which is not just you know, lip service, but help in making effective change? and what kind of challenges continue to persist and need to be tidied over uh, in terms of making diverse and inclusive platforms for community engagement and participation. So one way to sort of deal with massaging in a better public participation chance is to synergize institutionalized and non-institutionalized processes, taking in from existing participatory planning provisions and uh, aiming for better devolvement of power and autonomy uh, in decision making, which has been sort of used in many of the initiatives that some out of it, some have been listed in the table on the right. Uh, but that kind of synergy needs to be built in order to open up the field, if not make it completely leveled in terms of public participation. Porter Lecre again, giving us a popular example of how to institutionalize such kind of processes for decision making. And it actually helped in increasing the municipal revenue for these local neighborhoods as people started participating. Closer home, we have Janagraha, which did the ward vision campaign where communities were able to sort of create ward fact files and survey maps, identify what kind of challenges their neighborhoods were facing. and move from just the stage of consultation to working along with local officers and municipal officers towards implementation for you know pushing that change and from re realizing what kind of gaps exist to what can be done to address them and this was done in 10 selected wards and it was also quite effective in terms of building a good communication plan which was you know easy to read formats across different languages that were spoken, at least some of them, uh, and building sort of data tools that people were actually able to fill in because often that divide remains between the technical aspects of planning and the uh, former stages of expressing desire or need in terms of what, do, what, what does the community need or what does the stakeholder think is important for them. So at what stages can active public involvement and you know, decentralized decision-making actually enable effective change. Uh, the idea should be to sort of push from your formative stages of consultation and uh, awareness generation to uh, you know, advanced stages where people come to participate and partner in things which have higher bearing. So fund dispersal, budgeting, monitoring and evaluation, they automatically push people to having a higher stake in both decision-making and responsibility towards the interventions that are bring, being brought in. And local area planning and local, play, local planning initiatives give us that potential to tap that because you're facilitating the processes from a ground up level and where it can also be iterative. So 
the idea is to sort of look at how people's design wins. So this is an example from Naya Raipur where, uh, where uh, while creating a greenfield capital, uh, quote unquote greenfield capital, the erstwhile uh, village settlements were being integrated into the new capital instead of being erased. And the idea of co-creating village development plans gave people a better chance at negotiating for their design rather than getting the planner's vision sort of brought in for the future of their settlement. In our own work, we realized that while we were talking to women in Rajokri and Goga, uh, these women often, sorry, these women often didn't get that chance of direct access to any kind of planning decisions. And this, uh, this actually, this platform at the community workshop actually became one of the first ways in which they did actually identified need in a public platform and you know voted for their preferences but even with that even while getting see a seat at the table for having this conversation uh, there is definitely an acknowledgement of the existence of and persistence of challenges in building diverse and inclusive formats uh, for participatory planning because intersectional identities often sort of come to bear on how and who uh, participates, what they say, what they're allowed to say, and what kind of space they have. And often uh, these kind of platforms will lead to both, you know, potential for consensus, but also potential for, um, you know, conflicting interests. And then it becomes the effort to, from the plan, you know, from the sort of incoming agents to bring in those diverse and representative platforms. So for us, when we were working with uh, women in Goga, where Parda system and gender segregation is still very prevalent. What we tried to do was to have sub separate, you know, subgroups for all kinds of activities and then try to move them towards joint sessions and shared spaces. So when they felt that they could uh, articulate their needs in, in you know, subgroups, they felt more confident towards doing the same when they were put in the same space. Again, in Rajokri, we had this similar sort of experience, but the primary axis of stratification was uh, socioeconomic class and caste. So we had, you know, the Harijan Basti and the newer sort of migrant settlements having a separate FGD and, you know, survey than the older inhabitants who sort of almost refused to, you know, take part in the same platform. Here, one uh, aspect is to build differentiated platforms and also try to bring these conversations together, but supplement these with uh, rapid strate strategic interviews, that, which is what we did when we were looking at existing issues and challenges. So we went to the key informants in the settlement, uh, like the headmistress, you know, um, the school teachers, uh, Mohalla clinic members, the local municipal officers to take in their perspectives and supplement them with the consultations that we were doing with the community. The idea was to sort of build a mix of structured and unstructured formats. So this was one of the formats that has also been used in many other locations, which was based on you know visually drawn and uh, visually visual aids and illustrations where you had the samasya, samadhan, chunav and suja, which basically translate to problem, a solution, voting, and suggestion. It became an easy sort of format to facilitate and open up the discussion for what villagers would want and what kind of strategies they would they could think of in order to sort of address the challenges that they were facing. Again, also having a completely open formats, you know, which such as a visioning wall where you ask settlements, what do they expect uh, from you know, planning interventions and how do they uh, envision a future for their own settlements, such as, you know, the one on the bottom right is Hamara Rajokri Esaho, where they would just feel free to sort of actually write down things that, you know, that they may not be able to say to uh, in such processes. Um, just a quick summary of uh, some of the things that we've discussed, synergizing different modes of engagement building context sensitive channels and ensuring participation across multiple stages and processes. 
to move along the buck on building participation. Um, another key approach uh, that needs more thinking is ensuring adequately serviced, structurally stable and livable densification uh, in urban villages, uh, because one needs to think of efficient and innovative and flexible mechanisms when doing service provisioning for such settlements, given their built form. Uh, we have to think of movements within the existing regulatory sort of guidelines to ensure livability and uh, find out where development assistance or technological know-how can actually provide relief and incrementally increase, incrementally affect their, uh, you know, their exposure to safety risk. So innovation then becomes the keyword to go to for design, technology, and material to enhance durability and quality of both service infrastructure and the built form. And one needs to sort of then work with the existing settlement rather than see it as a can, uh, you know, continue to see it as a constraint. Um, in Nayaraipur, we had vertical stacking of infrastructure when the road widths were too narrow and abutting the structures on both sides. And the idea was to sort of also have it all in one go to avoid, you know, damage to the structures. Uh, again, another example of trying to innovate when providing fire emergency services in the old poles of Ahmedabad. So the idea is to sort of try these new bikes to uh, look at what kind of responses can be built. Though the kind of costs and the capacity was limiting, maybe installing water hydrants wherever possible to better this capacity can be more effective. Again, slum networking worked with the natural gradients and you know, topographic features uh, to give services in terms of your water, wastewater and stormwater drainage. Uh, so working with the natural gradients and available sort of, uh, you know, contours helped in, you know, tapping the potential of gravity-based services and reducing costs. Now, what kind of regulatory changes are required? The idea is to sort of look at the move space for movement uh, within permissible caps. So while the, there is acknowledgement even within the master plan that these are urban villages, uh, mixed use developments, what often happens is that they are not able to adapt to a building regulation, which is completely removed from their reality. Here, taking in different kinds of approaches can help. Uh, a key example is Vietnam's uh, integration approach, where they were looking to sort of provide universal service to all kinds of settlements, especially self-built settlements. Vietnam tried to not have an antagonistic sort of stance with its self-built settlements uh, and try to provide them uh, basic services wherever possible. You know, if you had a plot which was less than more than 20 square kilometers, you would be given essential services. And that kind of tenure security actually helped people who were living there to invest incrementally and improve their own living environments. Even when new areas were coming up, you would buy in with the sort of a private developer to help them fund that gap of uh, service infrastructure. And what that would enable is very heterogeneous sort of uh, urban fabrics. And the photo here is from Hanoi, where this kind of a heterogeneous uh, mixed fabric has almost become a trademark for the city. So again, and a few more examples from other locations like Sri Lanka, where the Million Houses program was done, again, working with the community to sort of see where you can, um, you know, make the regulations speak to both the needs and the realities on ground. Now, what kind of development assistance uh, actually ensure, you know, a better structural stability and adherence to safety norms? Now, MHS was leading one effort uh, to build capacity and credit channels where they worked with the community in workshops and actually gave them technological know-how to self-construct while also providing them credit channels through you know, the Bharti Samruti Finance Limited uh, to sort of to take on home improvement loans. And we can see in the images a significant change 
an improvement in the living uh, environments indoors. So definitely it can sort of make some kind of a positive impact on building both internal capacity of the community and their living environments. Uh, a similar sort of example from Botswana where uh, the sites and services team was used to you know, look at where you can sort of improve the structural stability, tackle issues of fronting and work within the kind of tenure constraints that existed uh, for the people who were living there. And building very, again, building visually drawn formats for easy knowledge sharing, uh, working with the community uh, in ways which are comfortable for them. So again, innovating in infrastructural provisioning rethinking standards and providing customized products, whether it's technical assistance or financial products. Uh, with this, I'll quickly jump on to the third key sort of approach, um, which is of seeking convergence where existing provisions and schemes can give us support to improve both living environments and livelihood opportunities for urban village settlements and communities. And trying to think of what kind of gaps are currently in place for policy, I mean, institutionally, and see where those can be sort of streamlined for better implementation uh, and better support for these communities. So um, the matrix sort of, in a very simplified fashion, represents the key authorities uh, that are uh, managing land administration, planning, and our service delivery specifically for urban villages. The ones that have been highlighted are some of these key agencies uh, and across the different scales. And what then happens is that you have some amount of machinery, especially for Delhi, I would say there is sort of some progression in comparison to other cities where organizational capacity has been built but what happens is that there is factored jurisdiction. So an urban village community member has to go to the revenue department to get their LALDORA certificate. But to uh, probably improve the public, so a public sort of space or you know, deal with water inundation in the village, they have to go to the Delhi Development, uh, Delhi Village Development Board, which is marked out in blue here, right? Uh, Delhi Development Board, Delhi Village Development Board, uh, DVDB, thus their mandate is limited to civic works, uh, upgradation of, you know, your common sort of sources of access roads, uh, ponds, lakes, cremation grounds. In Again, when they have to go for the, you know, get something to do with the utilities, they have to go to the MCD, which provides them basic services. So there's a lot of running around in some ways uh, to do. And these organizations, uh, these institutions often don't speak to each other uh, as much as they should for better coherent sort of action for people on ground. Again, apart from factual jurisdictions, what we also see is an overlap in mandates and restricted mandates. So DVDB, which works under the Delhi government and the Delhi Urban Development Authority, which works through MLA lad funds. Both of them have a similar sort of mandate of improvements in your common resources. They work on a project basis. So you have an overlap in terms of focus, but again, not speaking to each other. Uh, even in terms of planning, what we see is that the MPD says that the local development authority should plan, right? And this should be done actually. So MPD 2021 said that planning must be done for urban villages, which were recognized as special areas within three years of the master plan coming out. But not much has been done on that front. The planning department of Delhi government actually said, actually suggested that probably the irrigation and flood control department, their administrative unit, because it works on the ground a lot of times, uh, they would be better suited to make you know, local development plans. Delhi Village Development Plan, uh, Delhi Village Development Board and its local arms do their own kind of project based implementation. So they were working in that one silo, even though they have reached to the ground as is sort of apparent in 
the table here. So these kind of situations persist and what happens then is that urban villages sort of seem to fall through these interstitials into the interstitial sort of spaces. Um, again, this matrix in a very simple way plots the existing schemes and provisions uh, that urban villages actually could take support from. So uh, the bubbles actually uh, signify incidents here and not extent. And the different kinds of supports available are the red tags are for the COVID interim relief, the green tags give you uh, financial support, yellow tags mean capacity building and the blue ones mean infrastructural provisioning. So across different uh, sort of domains of habitat upgradation, livelihood opportunities and social infrastructure related support, you have a lot of schemes that could be tapped into, but they kind of remain, you know, on, up to the, up to probably the individual level to sort of cater in, to sort of take support from. So if we could sort of have a better understanding of how to see convergence from the existing funds and implementation mechanisms available, maybe we could think of moving towards more coherent sort of action for urban villages. So one is to sort of seek convergence within these existing schemes for targeted action and compound that effort to actually build towards integrated planning. And the second is to empower these existing institutions to, to sort of move the buck in terms of having very, very restricted um, jurisdictions and mandates and empowering them, especially when they have local reach. So a DVDB or a DUDA, which already have that mandate, looking at where that local arm that has been built into the organizational machinery can be enlivened to have a more holistic sort of range of functions beyond just basic upkeep and building, you know, systems of localized planning and ME &E for, you know, better, more coherent sort of approach. And I'll leave you there uh, and hand over to Rajit to take the discussion forward. Thank you, Neha. Um, I think I'll just...